uh, with a topic that will allow us to actually witness an international instrument as it is being developed, uh, something that has been called for for many years. And finally, the secretariats of UNCITRAL and ICSID have decided to develop for the first time a uh, binding and universal set of rules for conduct for adjudicators in investment disputes. Of course, it's an arduous task. task. It's something that's not going to be easy by any means. So uh, luckily today we are in good company uh, with somebody who can help us uh, understand the process from the beginning. Uh, Professor Chiara Giogetti was actually a scholar in residence for ICSID and participated in the drafting of the first version of the Code of Conduct. Um, she teaches and writes in the areas of public international law, international arbitration, international courts and tribunals. She has authored over 40 publications on these topics, including several authored and edited books. She served as a member of the Executive Council and Executive Committee of the American Society of International Law. She's the Vice President of the American Branch of the International Law Association, Chair of the Academic Council of the Institute of Transnational Arbitration, and a member of the Steering Committee of the Academic Forum on ISDS. Prior to joining the Richmond Law Faculty in 2012, Professor Giagetti practiced international arbitration in Washington, D.C., Geneva, Switzerland, uh, and served as a counsel in several interstate disputes. She holds a GSD and LLM from Yale Law School and a law degree from Bologna, and she clerked at the International Court of Justice at The Hague. So welcome, Professor Giorgetti. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Many thanks uh, for the very kind introduction and many thanks also for having me. I very much look forward to this conversation. It is our pleasure. And as I mentioned, uh, this is a topic that can be interesting from many perspectives to stakeholders who are following investment arbitrations from any area. So it could be states, it could be legal practitioners, but certainly academics who are following this very complex and sensitive area of law. Since we know that the fragmentation of the rules is one of the biggest issues that has always existed, but then also some other concerns surrounding decision makers in investment disputes, perhaps we can start this conversation with some background information about what prompted the development of the code of conduct. What were some of the concerns that were raised immediately before its development? Right, thank you. This is a very, very good question. Um, indeed, this is a... Um, an exercise uh, that is very much within the reform process of ISDS that is launched by the working group three of, uh, of, uh, of ANCITRAL. Um, and I think it's very important to say that because uh, the ISDS is undertaking a major reform process. And together with that, the, the, the working group, working group three has identified specific areas in which it wants to focus. And one of these areas is the code of conduct. And I think it's very important to, to say that uh, one of the issues here is linked to ISDS specifically in the sense who are the adjudicators, how we select the adjudicators, uh, and these are some of the criticism maybe that ISDS is facing. So looking at the adjudicators as such, one of the features that the working group very much prompted by uh, states, civil society, uh, and, and some specific delegations decided that they wanted to look at the, uh, uh, the ethics that apply, the ethics rules that would apply to, uh, to adjudicators and arbitrators uh, in ISDS. Um, so I think this is interesting because uh, it's, it's, it is in, within the reform of ISDS and also it's something that is signaling the very specific issues that ISDS confronts. So ISDS is a very unique dispute resolution mechanism that kind of unite something that is pu public international law and commercial arbitration. And you look at uh, other courts and tribunals and they also have at the same time uh, looked into ethics and approved ethics, ethics, ethics code for uh, their judges. So we look, for example, at the International Criminal Court, um, some, um, the ICTY, ICTR, the uh, Courts of Human Rights have also approached uh, uh, the, the, the issue of ethics and have developed their own uh, code of ethics. So on one side, we've seen that courts, uh, other international courts have looked at ethics uh, and, uh, uh, and at the same time, um, arbitration institutions have also looked at ethics that would apply, ethical rule that would apply. 
Um, ISDS as such is a system that does not fit any of the um, uh, any of the uh, of the specific uh, uh, groups is not uh, it's not a multilateral system that exists by itself like the WTO or, or uh, it doesn't sit only in one um, arbitration space it could be the ICC um, so it has he has a very very unique features so looking at ethics at, at IS, in, in the ISDS uh, looks first at so trying to to regulate a system that did not have any kind of rules that would apply. So this vacuum realization that there was a vacuum and realization that rules were required within the framework of reform of ISDS. At the same time, also in line with what existed in other international courts and also what is, what is developing in international commercial law. Um, and so providing some uniformity to users. So essentially three kinds of things. One is uh, regulation, Kind of providing uniformity in line with what was happening also in other international courts and tribunals. And one can only imagine how challenging it must be when you have this goal of having concrete rules and not just guidelines, and you want to put some marrow into these notions that usually govern ethics in international arbitration. Usually it's more of a gut feeling and certain standards rather than concrete hard and fast rules. So aside from the um, standards of independence and impartiality, integrity, diligence, and all these other expectations that arbitrators are usually subjected to, are there some specific concerns for investment arbitration that had to be taken into account that normally wouldn't uh, be counted in commercial cases, for example? Right, this is, this is another excellent question. So I, I also, I think you said something quite interesting in saying that we do have some rules and people feel that they can, uh, that they can behave well. So there mm -hmm. it has been some resistance saying, well, arbitrators know what, what, um, what they're supposed to do. But the truth of the matter is, and actually evidence also suggests that there are different understanding of what rules apply. And this is also typical of ISDS, which is a system that is intrinsically very diverse. So intrinsic, diverse in the sense of the, 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 the legal system that exists. So it's very common to have arbitrators of three different nationalities, counsel of many different nationalities, where different rules would apply. Um, so this idea of having a uniformity and having rules that are um, not uh, rules, uh, not uh, the, the rules that are mandatory, right? That apply in, in a mandatory way. As you said, we have a set of rules that are concerning that are typical to all international um, uh, rules, but also national. So for example, the idea that all arbitrators and judges, adjudicators in general, have to be independent and impartial. Um, they have to, um, you know, uh, have time. Uh, they have to apply the principle of, of diligence and others. So there are in in the draft code some of those rules that would apply to all uh, adjudicators in all uh, international settings. But there are, as you said, also some concerns or, or, or some uh, considerations that are very typical to ISDS. And I would mention three. One is the idea of issue conflict. This is something that was developed very much in ISDS and it exists saying, so and the, the problem is, is there a conflict that exists if an adjudicator, if a person has already said something about a specific issue? Does that preclude the participation of that adjudicator in other cases that face similar issues? Um, this is something that is possibly more typical to academics than others, but this is certainly something that is very characteristic to the ISDS. The second is the idea of um, having and sitting in several proceedings at the same time. There are no rules in ISDS on who can sit and how many cases an adjudicator can, um, can hear. Um, and so the idea of possibly regulating the number of cases so that to ensure that the arbitrators has time to dedicate to the case, uh, but also doesn't become conflicted. Uh, and the third issue is um, and probably the, the, the one that is even more characteristic to the SDS is the double heading or triple heading. The idea that one arbitrator can sit at the same time as counsel, so has the head of a counsel, as the head of an arbitrator, but may also have other heads like the experts. 
and this is very specific to the ISDS where the composition of arbitration, arbitration uh, tribunals are, are different and people play multiple roles. So these are very specific and these three issues were all included in the first draft uh, of the code as presented. So you mentioned it's a broad and diverse field, and then also we have people who appear in different roles and at different times. And naturally, that would be challenging in any kind of dispute resolution, but especially in a field where you have private persons deciding on measures that were issued by states. You have state interests involved, so it's very complex and sensitive in addition to their general decision-making role. So we, you have mentioned adjudicators several time, times, and for those who may not be so steeped in this process and following so closely, could you just clarify what exactly is an adjudicator in this context? And also as a follow-up then, are there different rules that apply differently to different kinds of decision makers in ISDS? Absolutely, thank you. Um, I think you raised a very important issue when you talked about uh, the, the, the role of the state and the fact that here um, we have many cases where are, that are kind of possible sensitive to states. Um, so that it could be, for example, looking at matters of, of health or environment where the regulatory power of the state is really prominent. And here, of course, that makes it uh, a very, uh, uh, where the concern of the state might be uh, important. And the, the idea that we have to guarantee a process where the arbitrators with the adjudicators are independent or impartial is even more important. And this is very much part of the ISDS reform process. And when you're thinking about the ISDS reform process, I think it's also interesting to think that there is a proposal to create a standing tribunal. Mm -hmm. This is very much something that the European Union is, uh, is backing and is proposing this idea that you would not have arbitrators that change for every case, but that you have a set of adjudicators uh, that are part of a standing court that would serve similarly to, for example, the International Court of Justice, they may serve for nine years, or they may serve for less or more. Um, but they would serve and only do that, only be judges. The idea of having a code, however, that is uniformly applied would include the possibility of having both arbitrators and, um, and judges. So whether this standing tribunal will come to existence or not, the code that has been developed will cover all kinds of eventualities. And so when we are thinking about this code and how the code is being negotiated, it, it, it is, as you said, a code that the title is the um, a code for adjudicators in ISDS, because adjudicators include arbitrators, but arbitrators that sit, for example, in uh, at ICSID sit and under uh, ancestral rules, but also include arbitrators that may be part of the ad hoc annulment committee under Dixon. So arbitrators in the, by, in the wider sense, uh, and possibly another option that may exist is the creation of an appeal uh, mechanism. So when we think about adjudicators on one side, we have arbitrators, um, including uh, uh, annulment, members of the ad hoc annulment committee, um, members of a possible appeal committee and arbitrators that hear cases now under exit ancestral rules or other institutional rules. And at the same time, adjudicators also include judges. Uh, and judges are defined as a person who are members of a standing mechanism for um, uh, investment um, uh, for ISDS. And when I, what I'm citing here now is the latest uh, draft of the, uh, of the code that was published in February of this year, 2022. And in the very first article, Article 1, include, def, include some definitions. So the first definition, uh, so, uh, uh, so it defines adjudicator as both arbitrators and judges, then define what arbitrators are, defines what judges are, and also defines, which I think is quite interesting, candidates. So that certain rules apply also to candidates, people that are being considered for arbitration positions or to be judges and assistant, um, because we also know that assistant may play uh, some, some role, 
Um, an assistant here means that a person is working under the direction or control of an adjudicator. What is also interesting is that the definition include also a definition of what um, ISDS is or IID, because here we're talking about international investment dispute. So here we say that an arbitrator means a person who is a member of an arbitral tribunal or a member of an ICSID ad hoc committee or is appointed to resolve an IID. And judges also say that it is a standing committee for IID. And IID are, are um, defined as a dispute between an investor and a state or a regional economic integration organization submitted pursuant to treaty providing for the protection of investment, inve investor, investment or investors, legislation governing foreign investment or an investment contract. And I think this is quite important to say because this provision was something that has actually been discussed quite uh, in depth by the negotiator, negotiators looking at, um, at the draft code. What is included in uh, IID? When we mean, what do we mean by an arbitrator or an adjudicator um, looking at, um, at these cases. Um, your second question was whether you have different provisions that apply. Uh, the latest version actually says yes, uh, that there are provisions and there's been one discussions of course, very much prompted also by, uh, by the European Union saying uh, that we have to have certain rules that apply only to judges or only to, um, to arbitrators. And uh, so the, 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 the latest draft includes these differences on issues, for example, like uh, um, uh, playing, uh, you know, duty of diligence, for example, here there's a difference between uh, judges and, um, and arbitrators, and this is article, draft article 5, saying that arbitrators, for example, should perform their duties diligently throughout the proceeding, devote sufficient time, and render all decisions in a timely manner and, there's a, and others. And then paragraphs are on the, the only applic, uh, applicable to judges says that judges shall be available to perform the duties of their office diligently consistent with their term of offices. And this is very much, this is very much reflecting um, the difference between having a judge who is only a judge and is part of a standing committee and its only professional responsibility is to be a judge and an arbitrator, and an arbitrator may have other uh, assignments also. Um, and there's a difference, therefore, that is included throughout the text between uh, provisions that apply to all adjudicators, that would only apply to judges, would only apply to arbitrators. And what I also think is interesting that there are certain provisions that only apply or can apply to candidates also, for example, issues pertaining to the acceptance, uh, ability to accept um, a case or ex parte communication, uh, which is also something that has been discussed uh, quite um, um, substantively by, um, by during the drafting process. I mean, everything you have outlined in this response shows that this is really a living and breathing instrument that is placed into a living and breathing reform process. So you have now made the connection with the proposal of the EU that is now well known and well prominent of establishing a multilateral investment court. Mm -hmm. Although we still don't even know what that will look like, you are trying now to make rules for the judges who will be appointed into that system. Right. So this is just in one response, all the complexities of this process have kind of been illustrated to, to everybody without going into other substantive issues mm -hmm. that were discussed so far. So considering the fact that it, it is an evolving process, what is the current stage of development of the draft code of conduct? So you mentioned there are multiple versions. So where do we stand right now as we speak? Right, thanks. So yes, it is part of a very large reform process, uh, which Ancestral Working Group 3 has undertaken and has actually now a, time, uh, a timeline um, so for those who are interested, the working group actually puts on the website of Ancetro all of the working documents, including uh, the time frame in which it hopes to conclude uh, all the reform process. And what is interesting also is that reform process is, is very large, as you mentioned, it has both very substantive, um, uh, very uh, uh, 
proposal that would really change in a radical way what we mean by ISDS, and also some very some more specific. And everything, all this goes in parallel, so that when the working group meets, and they normally meet twice a year, uh, once in New York in February and once in September in Vienna, they have uh, they they discuss. Um, some of these issues. The, uh, the code of conduct is one of the very specific um, pr proposal that has been discussed. So the first, as you said, there've been multiple drafts. The first draft that was published was published in May, 2020. Uh, and after it was published, uh, there was some discussion and it was open for comments. And I think this is very important because um, this process is a very interactive process. Um, and it's very important to say that this is of the reform processes, this is the only one that is developed that, that ANSITAL is doing in conjunction with ICSID. So the Secretariat of, uh, of uh, ICSID and uh, the Secretariat of ANSITAL are working together on this. And I think it's a very unique and very interesting um, collaboration between these two very important institutions. So it was open for comments and comments came in from, from states, but also from delegates uh, uh, other than states. Uh, and again, when you're thinking about the open process, uh, working group three uh, includes, of course, the permanent members of the ancestral commission, but also observers, uh, for example, the European Union, and also observers that are institutions or academics. So for example, I sit in the working group three as a representative of the ITA, the Institute for Transnational Arbitration. And, and as such, there are several other institutions that sit in the uh, working group three and are quite active, including both representing possibly uh, arbitration institutions or uh, more the, the, maybe the, the civil society. So representation is really very, very wide. The second draft uh, came out in April, 2021. It included those, uh, those uh, discussions by uh, by states, by comments by states. And then a third uh, draft also came out in September, 2021. Um, and these somehow follow discussions, uh, both kind of formal discussion within working group three, as I said, twice a year, uh, but also what are called intersessional meetings. Uh, intersessional meetings are, meet are meetings that occur in between the two sessions. Uh, and are also open to all delegates. And they are somehow more informal. Um, so for example, you call people by name rather than by title, but the, the, the fact that they're all very open for, for uh, discussions remain. They're very, uh, they're very um, they include a lot of, uh, of different uh, kind of constituencies. After September, 2021, there's been now a, um, a further it's not a draft, but it's a proposal um, that is that was put on the ANSITAL website. And I think you put the website mm -hmm. on, uh, on the chat, which is great, um, which is dated February 2022, uh, right before the last discussion that occurred online, because of course, these all happen also online because of COVID. So those obviously uh, reduced uh, the time that was available for discussion and impacted the discussion as well. Um, but so in February, 2022, there was a further um, um, draft uh, that was, um, that was, in, that was uh, put for discussion uh, for two delegates. And this draft is a revised version. So it's not draft four, but it's a revised version of the draft code of conduct. It includes not all of the articles, but only includes the first eight. Um, the, draft itself uh, is supposed to have altogether 11 and some of those provisions that have not been discussed yet include some of the very some of the very important ones including for example the issue of disclosure and the that is to um, to be uh, included in article 10 and um, and in article 11 implementation and enforcement of the code um, so these have not been fully discussed uh, and fully agreed on uh, yet. So where do we stand now? We had a discussion in February um, in a formal meeting that was then also followed up by some informal presentation. I think there was a very much of a hook 
um, that at the end of the February meeting, we would have a version of the draft that could be presented to the commission. And so the plan was that uh, there were to be uh, a, a, a draft, uh, approved draft to be presented to the commission in its annual meeting in the summer um, for final approval. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this, this not, it did not occur. Uh, it, the draft articles, as much as uh, there's been a consensus on several issue, uh, issues and very important issues, there's no consensus, consensus on all of the draft. And so we are kind of back into the, uh, the drafting uh, board. So we are, we are still uh, drafting and still thinking about um, some of the issues and how we resolve differences between the different um, uh, negotiating parties um, and trying to resolve uh, the final issues. So the draft, the code is still a draft. Um, it is not going to be presented this summer at the commission, but it is being discussed again in, um, in September in, in Vienna. Um, so I think uh, this is maybe, maybe a little bit of a disappointment, uh, but also, signals that parties take this process seriously. And so I think this is a good sign because I think states are very much involved into the drafting. This is a complex issue, that is an issue that will change a lot of ISDS. Um, and so the fact that it is not being um, discussed or presented to the commission now um, can also be seen as a sign that parties are taking this very seriously and they want to make sure that they reach a, um, a compromise that, uh, that makes sense to every, for everybody. It's interesting that uh, it, it turned out to be so complex because in the beginning, there were some commentators who were saying it's low hanging fruit, you know, regulating conduct should be something that's common sense and basically just adding some nuance to the existing rules. But then when the pen hit the paper and you see these words and then you try to imagine their impact in practice, then it becomes more and more challenging. And as you mentioned, the disclosure provision which is one of the most contested ones has not been addressed in the most recent revision for this exact reason. We have a lot of competing interests and considerations that have to be taken into account. But looking back now on the versions that have been published and commented on to date, as we know in the beginning, there were high ambitions and very strict ideas of what this code should be, how it should regulate and maybe even limit some of the freedoms of the arbitrators to ensure the integrity of the proceedings. How would you characterize the evolution of the standards over time? Have you seen them shifting from the very strict to a more lenient, or has there been back and forth in this kind of respect? Right, uh, thank you, this I think is very interesting. I have to say that I am one of those commentators that said this was a low hanging fruit. I have a, a publication there in saying it's a low hanging fruit. I still believe that in, in, um, in compared to other uh, reform uh, processes, this is a low hanging fruit. Uh, and I think we are close. Um, and I think it's important that we kind of bring it to an end. Um, but we have to bring it to the right conclusion, right? Where all the parties feel that they have um, rightly um, find, found a, a, a working compromise, but a compromise that makes sense in terms of ethics rule. Um, you mentioned that one of the big issue is actually, uh, before I respond to the multiple roles issue, um, I just wanted to make two very brief comments. One is the idea of disclosure obligations. Um, you mentioned that we have not yet reached a consensus, um, and this is very, very right. Uh, we, we, don't know, we don't know yet, although we have a new proposal, um, but there are a lot of issues there. Uh, some of the issues are how much, right? How much to disclose uh, in terms of timing, how much do we want to go back, um, how, uh, in terms of relationship, what kind of relationship, in relation to what kind of cases. So uh, interesting, um, uh, that the scope of the disclosure is still not um, agreed upon, but the idea that uh, disclosure is a requirement and that is kind of the main in, in implementation mechanism that we have, I think everybody agrees on. 
Uh, and we also agree on that the disclosure is something that is required by all adjudicators. Uh, that is a continuous duty and is also a duty that adjudicators have to uh, continuously seek to, um, to implement. So we have some agreements, but not all of the agreements. And then my second point, which I think you raised and is very interesting, um, is that together with the draft codes, we always also had a commentary. And the commentary essentially explains what the different provisions are about. And I think this is very interesting because it shows, it highlights some of the tensions that exist, some of where these um, provisions come from. Um, so for example, together with this general uh, idea of a code for all ISDS rules, we have uh, in parallel have developed some, some um, um, treaties, especially multilateral treaties, but not only have, have developed very recently a code for themselves. Um, CETA, for example, has a code uh, and others multilateral uh, regional uh, treaty have specific code of ethics. Um, and the ISDS process includes and is very much part of that and follows the trend that those code have, um, have uh, initiated. Uh, and this code also include a limit to um, uh, double hatting, uh, which is the, the issue that you wanted to discuss. And I think it's interesting here in several ways. So for example, if, um, if there is a standing court that uh, is created, uh, and if it's a standing court that includes, uh, that is supported widely and we do not have, that comes instead of um, ISDS system, then the idea of double hatting will not exist. And right? so double hatting only exists because we have this hybrid system where um, we don't elect, we don't select uh, judges and those judges can change. Every time there's a new case, we have a new, uh, a new arbitrator. The, yes, there are some lists, but those lists are very often not um, and not compulsory. So, who are those people that that sit in this uh, in this uh, judgment, and what can they do when in their other time, right? If they're not nominated because they don't know when they have cases, what can they do in their not spare time, but in their other professional time? Can they, for example, sit as counsel? Can they sit as uh, um, as experts? or can they be agents, or can they be working in an institution, right? So what are the limits? The code itself does not talk about double hatching, but only limit, something that is called the limit on multiple roles. Double hatching is not a kind of a technical term. We can make it a technical term, but we don't know because is it double hatching or triple hatching or whatever. So the, the, the framing since the very beginning, since the very first draft included a limit on multiple roles. If I look back at the very first draft, uh, there already actually, there was a choice between a mandatory prohibition, a full prohibition, or a requirement to disclose uh, serving in uh, multiple roles. So here it was article six, now has changed. It said at the adjudicator shell that this is all bracket because this is being negotiated, still being negotiated. So it's all in bracket. Uh, and there was a choice between uh, refrain from acting or disclose that they act. So this is the first choice. And then there were other choices, including so what are the positions, what are the roles? Counsel, expert witnesses, judge, agent, or in any other relevant role. And then the timing. So at the same time as that they are doing the cases or within a certain number of years, either before or after acting on matters. So um, there are several um, uh, kind of implications, several moving parts. One is whether it is a full prohibition or disclosure requirement. What kind of roles? What is the timing only concurrent or also going back? or kind of going forth for how many years? And also, of course, what kind of cases, right, would a double heading include? Uh, here on um, the, the very first draft, it includes all mem uh, acting on matters that involve the same parties or the same facts and or the same treaty. This was the very first draft. This, this article actually has undertaken, as you suggested, um, a lot of changes. 
Um, I think uh, the second draft was more uh, stringent in the sense of requiring uh, less of a regulation of multiple roles because there were a lot of discussions and lots of comments uh, by state and arbitrators. Then option draft three actually included three different options. And draft three that was very, very much discussed uh, in, um, I think it was um, the winter in, in, in uh, of, of uh, so not this, uh, not, not in this February, but the previous meeting, uh, provide three options. One is complete prohibition. The second was a modified prohibition. And the third was only disclosure. A lot of discussions there and kind of the compromise was in the middle. What does it mean though in the middle? So the idea is we want more than only disclosure. So not only disclosure, we want less, we think in you know, all the negotiators, we want less than complete prohibition, but we do want to regulate this uh, and limit multiple roles. And so the idea, so what, what is now, um, so now it's article four, uh, still include some of the same, uh, the same issues. So we say here we have that, uh, first of all, the disputing parties can actually say that they can, they can agree. So it opens with, unless the disputing parties agree otherwise, and, and this is only for arbitrators, as I mentioned, an arbitrator in an IID proceeding shall not act concurrently or, and this is an option, within a period of three years as a legal representative and expert witness in another IID. So here's a limit, it's only counsel or expert witness. We don't have any more the um, judge, agent or other relevant role. Um, in another IID proceeding involving the same measures, the same or related parties or the same provision in the same treaty. But also says that the arbitrator shall not act concurrently um, or within a period of three years as a legal representative or expert witness involving legal issues which are substantially or so similar that accepting such a role would create the appearance of a lack of independence of impartiality. So to sum up, and I know that, sorry, this is a little complicated, and maybe from here you want to put the, um, also uh, uh, a reference to where we find um, this document, which is uh, the CRP2, but is, I mean, it's essentially where, where you find it there in Ancestral. So I think we have taken out the two kind of extreme positions. So not only disclosure, not complete um, prohibition, parties can allow, but the variables or the, of the timing and the kind of cases are still being discussed. I think what, what I've seen, and this is very personal view of mine, what I've seen states asking is for a kind of a, a definition that is clear, but also strict because I don't want to have um, uh, any um, conflict of interest arising from uh, an arbitrator sitting in, 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 in multiple roles. Um, so uh, I think there is a better understanding of what we want to include in multiple roles, but I think we still are discussing some of the essential elements, including the timing and the kind of cases. And some of the issues also uh, that have been uh, discussed lately uh, in, in January 2022, this is when it was in January 2022 in an online discussion, whether, whether we want a cooling off period, uh, whether we want to have different rules for the presiding arbitrator, and whether this uh, idea of having a, a cases that are involving legal issues which are, which are substantially so similar um, is a workable definition, whether we can really provide um, a definition there. And as you just mentioned, it's always complicated. And although you know a prohibition seems like a simple solution because it's easy on the decision maker, on the other hand, 
self-regulation is the healthiest way to regulate um, ethics and conduct because people then should recognize themselves when they need to refuse an appointment, when they need to disclose certain things, and whether or not their previous or concurrent um, appointments might be problematic on this side. Anytime that we are prohibiting something, we are limiting party autonomy. And also, as you have written before in the preparatory analysis you did with Professor Abdel Wahab, you are also narrowing the pool of people who can then enter the field of arbitration because not everybody can afford to leave their council work for their first appointment as an arbitrator in investment arbitration and then who knows when the next one is going to come around so it's very um it's more more complicated in this middle ground than people might think yes i think you're very right it is complicated and this is why we want to get the right balance. However, I do think that we do need to find a way to regulate because of the, um, the very typical way, uh, the very, well, actually the unique issues of ISDS, which I mentioned at the beginning. Now, this is um, very diverse in one sense and not diverse in the other. So what I mean is by very diverse is it is a system that by its own construction includes many different legal traditions, right? So it's not, uh, as I mentioned, it's not, it's very, actually very typical to have arbitrators uh, sitting in a case uh, coming from uh, three different like three different places having very different kind of education civil law or, or common law or other uh, other traditions um, that have very different understanding of what the ethical ethical rules are and one issue is for example ex parte communication right so this is uh, this is something that is very different and depending on the legal tradition you come from uh, and because you're educated in a, in, a, in one legal tradition sometimes you say well so I know how to regulate this is how you do things. So it's important that we give directions to arbitrators that are uniform uh, and that are applicable throughout. Uh, but also, and this is quite interesting, there is, I think, a, uh, a perception which is not unique to arbitrators, uh, but it's something that we kind of all uh, have, that, um, that maybe we are uh, more capable than the, the average. So there are some interesting evidence that, that show cases that uh, um, in a, um, I think it was a post ICA um, uh, study uh, where arbitrators were uh, asked um, uh, to respond to some questions and there were, I don't know, there were a hundred arbitrators in a room that asked, are you more capable than the other people in the room? And about 75% of those arbitrators said yes. And of course, this is very, uh, very different, uh, not more capable, but like, are you, are you able to, to, um, uh, to provide, uh, to, are you always able to be independent and impartial? Is, is your ability to be uh, independent and impartial higher than the others? Um, and I think it's interesting because I think for arbitrators themselves, it is, you always kind of think that, yeah, of course, I can be independent and impartial. Uh, I can accept this role and I can, I can behave ethically. I don't think anybody thinks that they, can, they behave unethically. But this is why we need rules that are not only based on self-regulation, but they're based kind of an objective way to show what the right approach is, what it means to be independent and impartial, and what it means to require a certain kind of, of uh, disclosure, and what it means for conflicts, for example. Now we have a lot of challenges in relation to conflict. What is a conflict? If, if I go to law school uh, to, with somebody 20 years ago, um, and now that person appears uh, in front of me, am I conflicted? Uh, does it depend on how much I have uh, um, kept up uh, with this person throughout the years? Um, does it depend if I see this person socially or professionally? Right? So I think it's important to develop a common understanding of what the rules are in terms of conflict and in terms of uh, ethical rules in general. But um, I'm sorry, I know that we're almost out of time, but I yeah. also want to mention this idea of diversity because I said it's very diverse on one side, but it also pointed out that it's not diverse on others. And I think it's very important to point out that. Um, and I think there are um, objective uh, lack of diversity, both for relating to gender and geographical representation. 
And so I think we have to create a system that is more open and more diverse in this sense too, that is open to uh, more women, that is open to uh, people coming from all the regions in the world. And some people can say, well, if you prohibit uh, the idea of sitting both as council, as arbitrators, then you may reduce the available pool. Um, at the same time, if there are uh, less, um, if one person can occupy only one role, it means that there are more roles that can be occupied by, by other people. So I think it, it can be seen in both ways of the, the multiple roles uh, issue, both, both in terms of um, encouraging diversity, uh, but, but also impossibly in, in terms of restricting. And so we have to, again, we have to find the right balance to ensure that diversity, which is, I think is a very important uh, policy matters is uh, is taken into consideration in uh, um, in the code also. It's fascinating to hear all these implications that come from the outside. So we understand the policy level and the goals of having the code of conduct, but then you have this polarization of views and interests that different stakeholders might have in the process. And anybody who has time to read the public commentary that came from these stakeholders will see it clearly on paper. You have states on the one hand looking for very strict, very clear rules about, you know, how should the people making decisions about our measures behave. But then you have arbitrators who are basically offended by some of the standards that are raised because they feel, like you just said, we can remain independent and impartial, we are, and your indications otherwise are now jeopardizing our long reputations mm -hmm. as respected arbitrators. So it's very interesting to follow, but it's also very important to avoid such polarization because we might lose sight then of the purpose of the rules themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as we are really in, um, coming close to the end uh, and so many other questions to, re to raise, one very important question, that will then follow after this drafting itself is the enforcement. Mm -hmm. With full understanding that before we have an instrument, we don't know how it can be enforced. We don't know where it will fit in this matrix right now. Is there any discussion about possible enforcement mechanisms? Yes, uh, you, you raise a very important issue, of course. Um, and I'm also glad that you talked about the commentaries again. And I think you do see a discrepancy between uh, states and arbitrators, but of course there are different variations also within the states, but it's very telling to read the, um, the commentaries. The commentaries are there, or they are public. Um, very, very interesting read uh, and some of the states' positions also and how much stronger certain states are becoming. <clears throat> um, article 11 is the article that would um, include both the implementation and the enforcement of the code. Uh, there hasn't been really a, a, a very specific um, discussion, a very general discussion has existed, but not a very spe a specific discussion yet. However, UNCITRAL has put out uh, for discussion a paper that looks at, um, uh, uh, at implementation and enforcement of the code. Um, it, again, it's available on the website. Um, and of course, uh, all any kind of code will require uh, implementation and enforcement and strong implementation enforcement provision to make it a functional and, and a good instrument. Uh, and here we have to differentiate between the enforcement and the implementation. In terms of enforcement, there are several different possibilities that are kind of being discussed. One is whether, very simply, the code can just be um, implemented, uh, I mean, can be uh, used by the parties themselves. Sorry, I'm talking about implementation. The, 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 whether the parties themselves can decide to include and uh, use the code um, in, their, uh, in their dispute. So the parties themselves can say, okay, we have, uh, um, we want to use this code. Uh, it's a code that we, um, that we want to, um, that we want to, uh, um, to implement uh, between ourselves. So the parties themselves can say that. Institutions also can say, okay, we want to include this code and different, um, um, different institutions have different uh, priorities and different possibilities to actually do, do it. Um, so uh, uh, 
ICSID, for example, could easily include, uh, and I think I've heard some possibilities and discussions saying uh, that uh, the code could be included as an appendix to the disclosure form that each arbitrator has to fill in. Um, and so very simply, the institution itself can say, okay, now we apply this code. Uh, and so in terms of the implementation of the code, we can either have incorporation in procedural rules, um, declaration of adjudicators, or we can have an agreement of the parties themselves to include it, or kind of in a more difficult way, but another the possibility is it, can it have a treaty? We can incorporate the code in treaties, either in to be negotiated investment treaties, or in uh, uh, for the uh, European Union, for example, it can be included in the new possibilities of the creation of the court. Um, it can be included also kind of ex post. We can decide that um, uh, we can we can incorporate um, the code in, in existing treaties, kind of following the example of the Mauritius uh, treaties on um, on transparency. So many different ways that have been discussed in terms of implementation, but nothing has been decided yet. The second issue is the issue of, of enforcement. Um, this is another kind. Of, I think is one of the reasons also that prompted this idea of having a general code of ethics. How do we enforce ethics? Right? Who does it? Uh, what we have now is a very limited enforcement uh, by, uh, by institutions, but it's very limited. We see something maybe now at the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, um, but we only have kind of, the, um, kind of the explosive option to challenge, right? But there's nothing kind of in between and challenges is part of the parties. Now it's the parties regulation. Each institutions have sometimes very different challenging rules. So for example, ICSID has very different challenging rules than under Ancestral or under or Stockholm or the LCIA. And this is kind of part of the challenge. Also, sorry, uh, like the, the, the tensions or the, the difficulties in having, in, in, in having a general code. Um, um, uh, but so what are the challenges and whether any kind of violation of the, uh, of the code will result in a challenge to arbitrators in kind of, uh, kind of re requesting a, um, a, uh, um, that, the, that the arbitrators essentially that, that, that it has to, um, though she has to, to leave the arbitral tribunal, right? Decided by whom. Um, but what are other uh, sanctions that may exist? Um, at the moment, very few, but there are other possibilities. For example, we have been discussing uh, issues of uh, monetary uh, um, sanctions, uh, for example, resulting by delay, right? An arbitrator is taking up too, much, too many cases, doesn't have the time to meet, and it's late, uh, and then maybe we can implement certain monetary sanctions. Um, other are publications of a list of whether when arbitrators maybe not, not misbehave, but maybe have, maybe maybe do not follow the ethical rules. So a publication of when it happens and how it happened. Um, uh, the other question is: so there are existing sanctions, but there's also a possibility of developing new sanctions. And of course, how to who enforces these sanctions? Is it the arbitral institution themselves? Or do we want to create a center or, or kind of an ombudsman office that would um, hear uh, cases uh, and then sanction arbitrators appropriately in a way that possibly is the same across board? Because I think one of the issues is uniformity. We really want this code to be applied consistently. Um, so a lot of questions there. So this Article 11 of the code is very much still being negotiated. And in the uh, February 2020 um, revised version, there is no um, proposal for Article 11. I think we can see many new things uh, applying. Um, I think both in terms of implementation and enforcement, it can be a very rich discussion. But it's a discussion and is still uh, being, uh, being still, still to be had. Oh, absolutely. Monetary and reputational uh, sanctions will likely be the best incentive for people to comply with the code. But on the other hand, as you mentioned, in such a decentralized world, the main question might be then who imposes this? Who can order you to pay? Who do you pay it to? And then also, how do you do a dignified job of publishing lists that are justified, but then also in such a small community? it's much more complicated than people might 
uh, assume overall. Absolutely. Yeah. In the few minutes that we have left, uh, we do have a couple questions in the chat. But before we turn to that, could you just inform us briefly, maybe, what's the next step? So you mentioned that these are the code is discussed within the also trial working group three. So is there an indication? If, is it continuing uh, this fall as well? Yeah. Yes. And in fact, uh, the um, working group three has uh, obtained more negotiating time. Um, so now instead of two weeks, uh, there are more weeks. Although sometimes it's difficult also for negotiators to be able to uh, to come. Um, but yes, uh, the next meeting is in September, and this is Vienna, and hopefully there's going to be more in presence. Uh, although I have to say that online uh, has also allowed many delegations to be present. Um, so the next step is uh, September in Vienna, uh, picking up some of the pieces, but at the same time discussing other issues too. Uh, but this is, uh, so the, this idea that the code would be completed for the summer has not come to fruition, but the discussions are continuing in September. And most probably we will also have some intersessional um, continuing discussions on, on the code itself. Mm -hmm. it, we, I think we made a lot of progress. Um, we are not there yet, but I hope that uh, we will be there soon. Absolutely, and as you mentioned, it's not always a bad thing if things are delayed. Obviously, there's a lot of interest surrounding it. And as long as all the stakeholders are participating actively, in the end, what we might have is a better instrument, if not timely as expected before. Mm -hmm. So thank you again. We could definitely continue this discussion for each one of these articles for hours, but out of respect for everybody's time, um, I would just turn to the chat briefly. Mm -hmm. Ben has asked two separate questions. One refers to the term adjudicators, which might be confusing in some legal systems for those who are familiar with the adjudication procedure. So Ben is asking why not describe these persons as decision makers rather than adjudicators? I, I think it's more precise to call them adjudicators because one the, the main function is not only to take decision, but is to adjudicate. So the idea is to have, you can take many different kinds of decisions, but here the main function is adjudicators. Um, but I, I wonder if this question came before we said that there are definitions, very specific definitions that are included in Article 1 uh, of the code. And this we know that we're going to have and, and decide and specifically, so we have a general kind of chapeau that includes adjudicators. And then within that, within that we have more specific definitions of arbitrators and, and judge. Mm -hmm. And generally, the, there's an expectation that the code of conduct will be followed also by an official commentary that will probably provide specific extensions to the main definitions with more context. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm glad you raised that because one of the issues actually that was discussed in February was this idea of the commentary. Um, and then I, I, what I, I, I hear that the secretariats now, the exited ancestral secretariats are now working on the commentary which would also be, I think, is going to be kind of a live instrument, so that it's going to change. But I think it will look very much like the uh, commentary to the articles on state responsibility, where we have both theoretical uh, uh, discussions and, and definitions, but very much also uh, case law that is described. So the commentary is being um, developed, and I think it will be very important um, to be included in the code and uh, having also states uh, uh, knowing what uh, what what what's in the what is in the commentary. Excellent. And the second short question was with regards to triple heading. So this would be three concurrent roles. Could the issue be met by full disclosure? So I guess the question is, would that be sufficient if a person is actually acting in three separate roles? Well, so I think. The kind of states have um, made um, de decided that full disclosure would not be sufficient, and I think actually the decision is is correct. We want a little more than just full disclosure, uh, but at the same time, in this latest um, revision, it is included for the parties to be able to. Um, to approve any kind of, of uh, uh, multiple heading positions. So the parties can allow, um, but it's not only, um, so it, 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 it's full disclosure, but I think um, we probably want a, a little more. Um, 
when what what is what is the result uh, of full disclosure? Um, I think we want to include some some very specific uh, uh, directions to um, to arbitrators on what they need to do. So I'm not sure if I responded correctly because I'm not sure I understand the, the question with regard to could the issue be met by full disclosure. I think that we want um, we want as much disclosure as possible. But personally, I think that we also want uh, specific rules that arbitrators and, um, um, and adjudicators need to follow. Uh, some, some form of restrictions would be something that, um, that would be uh, important to have, some form of, of, of restrictions in play multiple roles. And in general, when, you, when there's a balance between prohibiting something or being very strict in the rules, maybe the best bright line would be the principle of reasonableness. So trying mm -hmm. to maintain reason and, and uh, matching what should be disclosed with what could potentially be a problem and what is a challengeable matter rather than just um, things that parties might find problematic that can then mm -hmm. go on in, in very broad terms in general. Yeah, so I, yes, I agree with you. I think it's important to think. So I, th I think the Article 4 as it is with all the challenges that we mentioned before, because we still have a lot of issues that have to be resolved, uh, by saying that uh, here shall, that, that the arbitrator shall not act concurrently uh, in other IID proceedings that have same measure or related parties or same provision of the same treaty, I think that provides kind of this, of, of a, yes, a, a reasonable mm -hmm. um, understanding of the different roles. Uh, I don't think only disclosure would be sufficient. I think we need a little more, uh, but we need specific roles that can be, um, can be applied. Thank you very much. You are really covering uh, very complex issues at light speed, and that's uh, very much appreciated considering the depth of knowledge that you have and uh, how steeped you have been in this process. We do appreciate your willingness to share all of this with our audience. I don't see any incoming comments in the chat, but if somebody does want to raise something briefly, briefly, we might accommodate that. But otherwise, uh, again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, and we will be following this process closely, both at the association um, and, and writing about it and commenting. And hopefully we can have you back when we have a finished product to speak about its success and you know, the very important changes that are likely to happen in the future. Thank you very much. It's really been a pleasure uh, to be here today. And thank you for the very stimulating uh, discussion. I would love to come back when, um, when the code is approved and hopefully this is going to be very soon. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. And thank you also for all our participants. We have had uh, many diverse people with a lot of backgrounds in, in different sectors. So it's interesting to see. The recording will be available on the Association Average YouTube page. We will share it with you as soon as it's available. And please continue following our ISDS webinar series because uh, we will keep trying to keep you updated on the most important issues. So with that, have a wonderful rest of the day, very successful week, and we will all be in touch very soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.